Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the U.S. Supreme Court. This emergency episode comes to you as part of Opinion Palooza. You can find all of our Supreme Court end-of-term coverage at slate.com slash opinion palooza. We're offering this emergency episode to all of our listeners, and we are thanking truly from the bottom of our hearts our Slate Plus members for the support they provide to make all of this possible for everyone. Hey, listen, for the folks who've been talking about the newly moderate 333 court in a series of important race cases over the last few weeks, today on Thursday, the Supreme Court ruled with all six Republican appointed justices in the majority that race conscious admission programs at Harvard and the University of North Carolina violate the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, thereby ending race-based affirmative action in college admissions for both public and private universities. Now, we are bringing you today's emergency podcast to work through, to be sure, 237 pages of opinions, including the majority opinion by Chief Justice John Roberts that I guess he was just born to write, advocating for colorblindness and applying the 14th Amendment, and also, as he has long insisted elsewhere, demanding that, quote, eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it, end quote. But... Mark Joseph Stern, my trusty co-pilot, who is reading these opinions as fast as he can, has some caveats that may or may not soften the Chief Justice's otherwise thunderous, in Mark's words, majority holding. So, Mark, welcome back. Thank you. I know you're still wiping the sweat off your brow from reading, but uh, not unexpected. Nevertheless, a pretty grim day. Yeah, I can't say I'm happy to be here, even though it's always great to be in your presence, Dahlia. This is a this is a bad one. I, I mean, this is a really big blow to efforts to achieve racial justice in this country. Not only because the court has effectively shut down affirmative action as we know it and as it has been practiced for more than 50 years with the court's blessing, um, but because, of course... The downstream consequences of that decision will be atrocious and will uh, unfortunately dramatically reduce the number of diverse and underrepresented minorities in the pipeline to all parts of American life, right? To business, to medicine, to science, technology, entertainment. This decision is a guarantee that white people who always take their racial privilege for granted continue to get to do that, to get a leg up through legacy admissions, through arcane sports practices, through just being the kind of white person admissions officers want to have in class, whereas underrepresented racial minorities are going to be, I think, um, looked at in some cases with an especially jaundiced eye because these admissions officers are going to be scared of lawsuits after this decision. And that means, again, that not only will universities be less diverse, but that all of the ways that universities serve as a springboard to public life, to uh, to a, a thriving career, to public service in this country, all of that is going to be affected and hampered by this decision. I think this is a really devastating day for the country. And so while I do want to point out how weird Robert's opinion is and what it doesn't say and in its caveats and maybe look for silver linings, I just kind of want to headline with this is going to make us all poorer. This is not just a blow to the actual people who will no longer be able to get into uh, the universities that they wish, but it will be just devastating to every person who values a diverse society. Yeah, I want to stay on that for one quick second, Mark. Um, my producer, Sara, had showed me a tweet that came out almost immediately after the opinion from our friend Larry Gostin, um, who just tweeted this ban on affirmative action, he writes, shows willful disregard of precedent and 300 years of systemic racism. The reality is far from race neutral. SCOTUS will handcuff health agencies from achieving equity 
from maternal health to COVID and cancer, Blacks have far worse health outcomes. And you and I both um, clocked a piece that was written about just at the amazing difficulty in getting into, you know, uh, uh, pre-med and med programs if you're African-American, and also the correlation uh, between having a doctor who is African-American and health outcomes for uh, African-Americans. So this has, as you say, unbelievably concrete knock-on effects that are seemingly invisible to the majority. I do want to talk about your silver lining for a minute because I think you make the point in your piece today, and it's worth, I think, lifting up because the headlines are very extreme uh, in their construction of what happened, that while on the face of it, uh, today's holdings look like a massive repudiation of a whole line of cases that goes all the way back to Baki and Grutter and Fisher. And that murky but mushy standard that said, you know, race could be used as a factor in a holistic program. But as you note in your piece, the chief doesn't fully overturn that precedent. He doesn't explain what his new mushy but murky standard is. It's as though, and I think he gets accused of this by Justice Sotomayor, he overturns precedent without overturning it, and then doesn't quite tell us what admissions look like going forward, right? It's it's a classic move for the chief, who does not want to look like he's taking a wrecking ball to precedent, um, and always wants to seem as if he's working within the confines of what the court held in the past. And so that's right. There's no statement in the chief justice's majority opinion saying, We hereby overrule the precedents allowing affirmative action. We hereby abolish affirmative action. Instead, what the chief does is look at the admissions programs in question, which come from Harvard and UNC, University of North Carolina, and says that they do not satisfy the strict scrutiny standard that the court has said is required uh, for an admissions program like this to comply with the Equal Protection Clause. But I want to get into exactly how he does it because I think the devil really is in the details. So the court has always said that there's a compelling interest in classroom diversity, that having more diverse uh, viewpoints, folks from different backgrounds, that that is an educational benefit for everyone. And I think like Anyone with common sense probably should agree, but it's very difficult to quantify how that benefit cashes out in the real world. And so Roberts really kind of goes after these institutions for saying that the benefits they're chasing are the goal of training future leaders, promoting robust exchange of ideas, you know, helping everybody hear all kinds of viewpoints uh, and and, um, the stories of people from different parts of America and using that to develop their own educational journey. And Roberts really dings the universities and says, that is not measurable. That is not a judicially measurable standard that we can subject to meaningful judicial review. And so we are not going to hold that these programs satisfy this compelling interest because we don't really see how you can link your actual program to some kind of measurable standard. And one thing I want to point out that our friend Ian Milheiser at Vox has also noted is that this is sort of a catch-22 because what the court has said in past cases, including Grutter, is that you can't quantify on the basis of race, that you can never use numbers or quotas or anything that looks like that to measure how you're building out a class or what the benefits of affirmative action are, that you have to undertake this holistic review and that you have to aim toward this very hazy goal of classroom benefits that flow from diversity. And now the chief says, well, the universities did that, but they did it in a way that violates the Equal Protection Clause, which means that there's really no way to do it. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If you try to measure these goals and say, for instance, there were five Black people in this breakout group, and there were two Black people in this other breakout group, and the students learned more and engaged more in the breakout group with five Black students than two Black students, the court would say that violates equal protection. But that is what Roberts is demanding in this opinion. And so I do think that, again, Sotomayor is correct to say that what the chief is essentially doing is overturning all of those precedents, because he's made it impossible 
impossible to comply with them to, to navigate the Scylla and Charybdis, as lawyers like to say. Um, and any university that tries it and admits to trying it is going to get saddled with lawsuits that they are going to struggle to win with this precedent looming over them. One thing that's worth saying, because I'm sure not all our listeners know this history, but this classroom diversity as the benefit of affirmative action is just a vestige of Baki in the cases that come before. In other words, it was always not permissible to say we are going to permit affirmative action to remediate you know, the vestiges of centuries of discrimination. We're doing it for this very inchoate, as I said, mushy standard that is diversity. So in some sense, we we have to dance with the guy that brought us, and that's this standard of classroom diversity. It is hugely problematic that because that is the tool that is used to justify affirmative action, it's now sort of dismissed where I think if you read both uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Jackson's dissents, it is so clear that the reason that we live in a system of endless, unremitting uh, racial disparities is because of a long, long history of past discrimination. So in some sense, we've been given a tool here classroom diversity that is separate and apart from the history that Justice Jackson so flawlessly lays out. Yeah, and I guess I just want to add like a footnote as to why this happened and and how compromises can come back to bite the the progressive flank of the court. So, you know, this happened because in Bakke in the late 70s, Justice Powell wrote this solo opinion. The court sort of divided 4-1-4. And he wrote the opinion saying affirmative action cannot be used as a remedial measure, but it can be used to build out diversity for classroom benefits. And then Justice Sonia, sorry, uh, Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, who you should never confuse with Justice Sonia Sotomayor, said in Grutter the same thing. We affirm Justice Powell's standard. This is all about classroom diversity. Justice Kennedy, years later, comes in in the Fisher case and says, again, this is all about classroom diversity. We're not looking to the past. And that made it so easy for the 6-3 court to come in today and say, oh yeah, classroom diversity? What the hell is that even mean? Like, what are you guys talking about? This is ridiculous. Get the hell out of here with this. And it's sort of like, okay, yeah, like, I get it. He's right that it's very hard to measure leadership and all of these other goals that universities are aiming toward, but they're only saying that because they're not allowed to acknowledge that there's a massive history of racial terror and persecution that underlies these policies that the Supreme Court has gagged them from talking about. And so, you know, it's 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 interesting to sort of imagine, like, going back to that case in the late 70s, to Bakke, imagine if Justice Thurgood Marshall had won out. He wrote the opinion saying, no, we have to talk about racial discrimination. We have to talk about how these are remedial programs to help young people who come from backgrounds that you rich white folks could never understand. Um, What would have happened then? How would this jurisprudence have developed? And I just think it's it's a path not taken that has led to a real catastrophe today. Although you make this point in your piece and you tweeted it and it's so urgently important. If we think back to Grutter uh, and the decision, right, we remember in the Michigan cases, there was a real fear that the court was going to end affirmative action then. And one of the dispositive things is the green brief, right? The military amicus brief that says, ho, 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 wait, wait, wait. (laughs) If you end affirmative action in higher education, the result for our fighting forces will be catastrophic. And apparently that wins the day. And what you clock today, it's so important, is that Chief Justice Roberts sort of undercuts all his arguments that blah, 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 diversity and blah, 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 leadership, there's no discernible educational benefits using this squishy standards. And then he carves out military schools. (laughs) And and so I just, like, I wish that we could have watched the drafts flying back and forth behind the scenes to understand how this and the other concession we'll talk about in a second came to be. But it seems to me that what happened is that Justice Sotomayor brought up this issue in her dissent. She has this whole long passage about how this 
decision could be a threat to national security, that the military has told us that diversity is incredibly important to a fighting force that's effective and ready, that military institutes are the springboard to leadership in that fighting force, and that this decision could thus actually hamstring the military and uh, hamper national security. And then Justice Roberts has this footnote where he says, oh, we're excluding military institutes from this analysis, so you don't have to worry about that. And it really sounds to me like Sotomayor wrote that in her dissent first. Roberts read it and was like, oh, I'm just going to make this irrelevant by carving out this massive part of higher education in America, right? Like these, there are many military academies. They have many students just saying this doesn't apply to them because of the unique circumstances of these academies, which is like, okay, so it's outrageously racist to use affirmative action in civilian education, but maybe totally okay to use it in military education, like it, it really doesn't make sense. And that I think is just, maybe the core was rushing to get this out. Maybe it was hard to put together six votes on military academies, but yeah, the big issue in Gruder somehow remains unresolved after today. And that is kind of freaking crazy. Right. And just to, to, to put the finest point on it, I can, I think you've said this, but I want to say it again. All of those rationales that have no purpose in any other educational context apparently still apply in the military, but he's not telling us why. He's just saying it's special. Yeah, that's right. Good argument. Thank you, Chief. Okay, so the other thing that you clocked, and I think it's really important, is the great essay off, right? Whether there <laughs> is a backdoor to bring up race as part of a, a college application, if you can't do it by, quote, ticking a box, you can still do it in your essays. And I want to just play for one second, because this was, in fact, the Katanji Brown Jackson uh, hypo at oral argument that I think caught our attention at the time when we were taping and got a lot of public attention on, like, huh, this seems unfair. So let's play it. The first applicant says, I'm from North Carolina. My family has been in this area for generations since before the Civil War. And I would like uh, you to know that I will be the fifth generation to graduate from the University of North Carolina. I now have that opportunity to, to do that. And given my family background, it's important to me that I get to attend this university. I want to honor my family's legacy by going to this school. The second applicant says, I'm from North Carolina. My family's been in this area for generations since before the Civil War, but they were slaves and never had a chance to attend this venerable institution. As an African American, I now have that opportunity. And given my family, family background, it's important to me to attend this university. I want to honor my family legacy by going to this school. Now, as I understand your no race conscious admissions rule, these two applicants would have a dramatically different opportunity to tell their family stories and to have them count. It does really feel that, you know, we have on the one hand, the chief justice saying, you know, oh, that's not an, an issue. It's not a problem. Uh, students can raise it in their essays. He writes, quote, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. And again, both Sotomayor and Justice Jackson in their dissents are like, I guess you're not going to let people put it in their essays. So I, I cannot believe that the most consequential affirmative action case in a half century comes down into a fight about whether students can talk about race in their essays. But there we are. It's truly crazy. And I think like... This was an area where clearly the dissenters extracted this concession. This is tacked on to the very end of the chief justice's opinion. It's like, yada, 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 we hate affirmative action, but... And then he addresses Jackson and Sotomayor, both of whom raise this, and Jackson actually repeats that hypo in her opinion. Um, you know, can this Black applicant talk about the family's history with slavery and racism and Jim Crow? And so Robert says, and like, this is slicing the baloney so thin, as, <laughs> as Justice Kagan likes to say, he says, a benefit to a student who overcame racial discrimination must be tied to that student's courage and determination. <laughs> 
<laughs> and his overarching rule is the student must be treated based on his or her experiences as an individual, not on the basis of race. But of course, the whole argument is that you cannot distinguish the individual's experience as a person from the individual's race. They believe the two are intertwined. And so it's almost like the chief justice is running headlong into his own racial ignorance, his own inability to understand why a first-generation Black applicant to UNC would view his race and his identity as intertwined, would view his own life experiences and his racial identity as in many ways one and the same. The chief can't wrap his head around it, which is pathetic because there have been so many briefs in these cases, so many arguments at the lectern, so many brilliant points in both dissents, trying again and again to make the chief just get this, and he doesn't. And so in this concession, we just see him conceding away some very hazy and ambiguous, but maybe meaningful, room for admissions programs to consider race as long as it's intertwined with identity. That, I think, is good, I guess, better than <laughs> not having it. But at the same time, it could very much lead to lawsuits, complaints, bad PR, a lot of people who are denied admissions claiming that the university exploited this little passage in the opinion and, and read it for more than it was. And so I do think schools are going to be very scared to really capitalize on whatever room the chief left, because there are groups out there, like the group that brought this lawsuit, Students for Fair Admission, that stand on guard and ready to attack with lawsuits any university that seems to be letting in too many underrepresented racial minorities. And, and I want to just take one more slice at that incredibly, incredibly thin luncheon meat, because it does feel <laughs> as though uh, the chief justice right at the end writes... Quote, but despite the dissent's assertion to the contrary, universities may not simply establish through application essays or other means the regime we hold unlawful today. So it's like he's opening the essay door, closing the essay door, opening the essay door and closing it again. And I guess you're right. I think that you're supposed to I guess you're supposed to invoke race the way Donald Trump classifies declassifies documents, like you can do it with your <laughs> mind. But there's no actual map here to, as you say, how you could possibly assert that this materially matters to your discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise, without somehow triggering somebody bringing a lawsuit, because he's very clear that you can't do it through your essays or other means that we hold unlawful today. It is just such a ridiculous ridiculous, ridiculous Escher staircase of logic. And it really leaves us, I think, as you started in this position of, I guess he didn't overrule uh, uh, Baki and uh, Grutter and Fisher, but we don't know what the test is. And he makes these kind of colorblind assertions that apparently don't apply to the military. And it feels like another one of those markers of everything is changing, but I'm not telling you how in some sense. You know, I'm thinking about Dobbs last year where we got very, very high and mighty language about what is bad without any understanding of how it would affect people on the ground, but also how do they order their lives to comply? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's... I I'll just say, I'll give her some credit, even though she screwed up royally here. Sandra Day O'Connor understood that. And it's clear we've learned from Justice Stevens' papers when the court was negotiating Gruder, O'Connor got that people, that universities, that this nation needs guideposts to understand what is permissible and what they are allowed to do and what will be uh, a, a huge disaster that rains lawsuits down upon them. And we've lost that now, right? Like we had it for 20 something years, 20 years, and now we've lost it. And I guess the, the one thing I'll add is, well, O'Connor closed her opinion saying, we assume, we hope, we anticipate that affirmative action will no longer be necessary in 25 years. We are not 25 years away from Gruder. We are 20 years away. And Justice Brett Kavanaugh, in his concurrence, makes a really interesting attempt to square that by saying, OK, but the next class of students is going to be the class of 2028. 
And if you use 2028 as your year, then it has been 25 years since Gruder. And that means we totally complied with what the court held in that decision. And I am just making it very clear that I love stare decisis and I would never overturn President <coughs> Dobbs uh, that I just disagree with. And, you know, I think that's another sign of <laughs> these guys in the majority, these white Dudes in the majority, they don't get so much of this, and they fundamentally want the nation to believe that the court hasn't changed. You know, all that's happened is the nation has progressed. You all should pat yourselves on the back because racism is basically over, and anybody can just look around and realize that that is not the case. Yeah, I I thought of that Kavanaugh concurrence as like him opening the fridge and like looking at the sell by date that Justice O'Connor put into Grutter and like sniffing it and being like, yeah, yeah we're, we're close enough, uh, which is like a really good approach to yogurt and cheese products and maybe not to, you know, fundamental um, equality and dignity for all. I don't want to end, Mark, without just talking about Justice Sotomayor's and Justice Katanji Brown Jackson's dissents are quite remarkable. But I just want to lift up for one second, because I think uh, we saw this, and I think you and I wrote about it when the cases were argued, that it is, in fact, falling upon Justice Jackson to be the voice of history on this court, to say, you may feel really good, Chief Justice Roberts, saying that racial discrimination ended on the day that you picked, but that's not how it goes. And there is this line uh, in her dissent where she says, quote, history speaks. In some form, it can be heard forever. The race-based gaps that first developed centuries ago are echoes from the past that still exist today. By all accounts, they are still stark. And I just want to hold out for people that her dissent in some sense is just a masterclass on the ways in which redlining and sharecropping and the GI Bill and credit and every aspect of how American life was organized and continues to be organized creates these gaps in uh, possibility, in achievement. Uh, You know, she is so clear that anybody who thinks that history stops on whatever the date is that the toaster popped for John Roberts, you know, whether it's brown (laughs) or whatever it is, that that's not, in fact, when history stopped and it's not how history worked. And I just think it is so powerfully important in this moment when we are having conversations about critical race theory and having conversations about history books and what we can and cannot read to just see what it is that Justice Jackson is lifting up. Because as you're saying, the fact that this affects Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch, not at all. The fact that it it doesn't even kind of pass their radar, that this history is still echoing with us today is why it's just so foundationally important that Justice Jackson is using her voice this way. 100%. And in addition to speaking truth to power, weaving that story of racism into the law and into the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, right? And this so infuriates Justice Clarence Thomas, who writes this very long concurrence explaining why, in his originalist view, the 14th Amendment requires colorblindness. But, I mean, readers can decide for themselves who has the history right. I think Justice Jackson does an extraordinary job explaining that the people who wrote the 14th Amendment understood that race-conscious measures would be necessary to ensure that Black Americans could finally achieve equal citizenship and that they did not put an expiration date on those measures. Uh, This was not a kind of, uh, like, temporary thing that they said, well, you know, we had slavery for a couple hundred years, we'll give eight months of race-conscious remedies and then we'll slam the door shut. No, no, no. The people who wrote and ratified the 14th Amendment passed laws that would have indefinitely 
given the government the ability to use race as a benchmark to promote the civil rights and civil equality of Black people. They themselves wrote and passed laws that this Supreme Court might strike down under the 14th Amendment. And if that is not proof that Thomas's originalist analysis is seriously flawed, I, I am not sure what is. One slightly wonders where Chief Justice Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh um, and the great protectors of voting rights in the last couple of weeks and <laughs> Indian Child Welfare Act and the, the need to remediate um, atrocities and past harms uh, where they were when uh, this was being drafted. Mark Joseph Stern, I cannot thank you enough. I know today has been on skates. Uh, <laughs> Friday is going to be the last day of the term, and we've got a couple of huge, huge cases to come, uh, but I cannot thank you enough for being my partner in slight despair. But as you note in your piece, I think both Justice Jackson and Justice Sotomayor, uh, you know, make plain that this is a pendulum and it can still swing back to correct itself. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dahlia. And that is a wrap for this episode, Emergency Bonus affirmative action episode of amicus thank you all for listening in thank you so much for your letters and your questions and your comments thank you for your support uh, of slate plus you can keep in touch with us at amicus at slate.com and you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast today's show was produced by sarah burningham alicia montgomery is vice president of audio at slate and ben richmond is our senior director of operations We will be back with another episode of Amicus on Saturday. Until then, take good care of yourselves.